is a huge, huge honor for me to be interviewing what I call the rarest unicorns I've ever seen, which is two brothers who both graduated from dental school in 2012. And you guys practice up the street for me. And I know so many local dentists who just think you guys are the bomb. Uh, I'm in Phoenix, but in the park called Ahwatukee, even right across from Ahwatukee is Chandler. And that's where you guys are on Chandler, right? Yep. And, uh, and what's funny is you're uh, bald and name is Elliot and I'm uh, bald and I practice on Elliot. So, uh, when I uh, shaved it today, I looked in the mirror and I went, oh my goodness, I'm starting to look like Howard Fran. I'm 20, <laughs> 25 years away. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you'll look like uh, when you're a grandpa. And, uh, but the reason I contacted you is because I keep getting requests um, from fans of the show that, um, hey, don't talk to a bunch of old guys who mastered implants and root canals. They want to hear from young guys uh, that just got out recently, and I can't think of any two guys that got out. I mean, you got out in 2012, and from every metric that I would judge someone on, you're happy and healthy and crushing it in dentistry. Thanks for giving me an hour of your time, guys. Thank you. So, so if you were, so, so tell us your story. First of all, everybody's got to know, how did two brothers graduate in the same year of dental school? Your dad has to be a dentist. No, actually engineer. <laughs> an engineer. Is that right? But I'll give you a little of the backstory. I guess it starts with me. I'm, I'm four years older than Elliot. Uh, and I knew I wanted to go into healthcare, but didn't know much about dentistry because we don't have a family background. I went to medical school first. And it was during my third year of medical school, learning about all the different branches of medicine and what residency I might want to choose that Elliot was applying to dental school. Um, I, I saw opportunity for oral and maxillofacial surgery as a potential. And as soon as I graduated medical school, came straight to dental and joined Elliot's class. So you're an, you're an MD and a DDS or DMD or what? DMD. Yep. So you're an MD and a DMD? Correct. Now, are you going to become an oral surgeon? No, I, that's part of the beauty of dentistry is, is coming in and learning all about the field and the opportunities. What I really, my passion is, is technology and healthcare in general, but, but learning that there's so much growth, so much opportunity in dentistry with technology, um, I, I better off doing general dentistry and all of the stuff that can incorporate into it. So were you born and raised in Chandler? No, born in Pocatello, Idaho, of all places, but grew up uh, mostly in Tempe. We uh, moved out when I was eight years old. Yeah, my, my, I'm, my walnut brain's trying to figure out how I can live in Phoenix in the winter and Idaho or Alaska in the summer. So I, I, I think I'm going to sell my house and get a fifth wheel and just, uh, you know, that, that, that would be the dream. So, so um, what the podcast, what so many people are asking me to know is uh, um, when you came out of school, just walk us through how – going from graduation to practicing and and tell us your journey what good moves did you make because they're scared they're scared they got three to four hundred thousand dollars in debt they've never owned their own business if your mom was a stay-home mom and made cookies and dad worked as an employee somewhere they don't know business uh, you know your dad was an engineer was he an employee for someone or did he own his own engineering firm so you know the area as well. That's when we moved out here. We lived at Ray and Rural. It's about three miles from where you practice. About five from us. Um, and when we moved, that was the edge of civilization in Phoenix in 1990. <laughs> and Motorola had built a plant there. So he worked for Motorola for a series of years, then on semiconductor, and then he's moved around still in the semiconductor tech industry. Um, so yeah, that's that's what brought us here, and that's that's where he went. Um, I think the biggest thing he instilled in the two of us was. He worked for corporate America, having bosses and working his way up to the level of a director. And he was pretty firm in instilling in us, acquiring a skill where you can be entrepreneurial. You can work for yourself or you can make choices to work for others. And so we saw that from him and he kind of pushed us a different direction to be kind of self-made men or, or more self-reliant. I, I think it's the, uh, the greatest thing in the world not to have a boss. I mean, I just can't think of, I mean, you know, then that, that's why I, uh, I mean, I, I love dentistry. I mean, the physician friends, uh, the, the politics going on at the local hospital dwarfs the Republican debates. I mean, they, they, just, they just want you, the, the, the price of freedom to go into work and do whatever you want to do is, is priceless. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what, so um, what would you tell a kid? Tell, tell us your journey about how, how do you go from graduating? Did your dad pay for your school or did you guys have student loans? No. So he's, he's even been on the job hunt in the past three to five years. So it's not as though we've come from a background where 
this was going to be just a cakewalk with no let, no debt or anything like that. Um, I took an aptitude test in my sophomore year of high school that told me I should either be an Air Force pilot or an orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it started for me is I looked at it and I went, Air Force pilot, I'm going to get divorced. I'm going to have kids all over the country. I, I need that. The orthodontist sounds like the safest thing in the world. So I knew as a sophomore in high school, this is what I was going to do. And I started setting those three, five-year goals all the way through dental school. Um, we both went to ASU, uh, applied and went to the A.T. Still University, the local dental school, the first one that opened in Arizona. Uh, and then as we got out, I found some, some realities I hadn't really recognized in the dental field. And this may be why you're getting those requests. I had in the back of my mind that the typical dentist went to dental school and then came out. He was able to hang a shingle and just find ultimate success, work three, four days a week, uh, go golfing and have this six-figure salary of just kind of this magical career. And I think there may have been a, a sweet spot in history where that might have been the case, but that's just not the case anymore. So some of the realities we hit were that we were graduating in Arizona, an area that others would refer to as saturated. So as we went looking for where or how to open a dental practice, every corner is already taken around here. It's insanely saturated. It has two dental schools in one city with fluoride in the water. Right. <laughs> I, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't really get any worse than right here. Yeah. The other new reality is we were getting out of dental school with, and we have no problem sharing our figures. Um, I, I was lucky enough to have a scholarship in dental school, the WICHE, which is the Western uh, exchange that pays – when you don't have a state school, they kind of pay some of your tuition. And that discounted my education about $80,000. But I still got out with about three twenty, three thirty, three hundred and twenty, three hundred and thirty thousand dollars in dental school debt. And my brother went to medical school beforehand, so he was he was way, way worse off. I, I, I have more debt than most people I've rubbed shoulders with. What is your debt? Uh, I'm over seven hundred at this point. Seven twenty five was the latest mm -hmm. figure. With See, I thought I thought your brother Elliot was uh, had more debt because he doesn't even have enough money to buy a wig. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I must worry about it more. <laughs> so, 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 um, that number seems big. So, are now are you guys fifty fifty partners in a dental office? We are. Yep. And, and a lot of people sit there and say, "Okay, well, you know, if uh, uh, you're seven hundred, so you're a million dollars in debt." And it's like, well, I, I don't I don't really see why that bothers anybody because. Every dentist I know that's uh, 40 years old and above lives in a million-dollar home. So if you kids come out of school with all this debt, maybe instead of a million-dollar home, you'll have a half a million-dollar home. Right. And, then, and then I know I say this over and over and over, and, lot, and I, it's not as a joke that gets told, but that every time a dentist gets divorced, it's at least one to three million dollars. Right. And so if you just uh, keep your wife, then you graduated without student loans. Right. Uh, you know, and uh, so, so then if you're 700, you're 330, um, how were you able to open up your own practice? Because a lot of kids are saying this. They're saying, you know what? I should join the Navy for four years or the Indian Public Health Service or go work at Heartland or, or Pacific Dental Services and pay out my student loans first. What would you say to that advice? I would say if you're passionate about one of those avenues, then more power to you. You, you should go and do that. If, if that's something that fits you really well, we have a close friend that graduated with us, went to Heartland out in Iowa, he approached them and just said, I want to get fast. I want to do. Who are you oh. talking about? He knows who it is. Tan Tanner Flaherty. <laughs> I'm the one who told him to call her. I, 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 I had Rick Workman call him. Yeah. And, and we're aware of that relationship as so well. So get the story right. Uh, but, and he's crushing it with Heartland. Crushing it. crushing it. And that fits him really well, but it might not fit everyone. But why go. did that fit him very well? Because, you know, corporate America, that's the devil. I mean, I mean, you, you go, go into dental town and say corporate dentistry and, you know, fangs come out. So, so why is it working for your friend? So for Tanner, knowing him really well, he's not one that uh, wanted to do a lot of his own business management from what we heard from him. It's not his forte. His forte really was getting in the dental chair, leaving at the end of the night, not thinking again about dentistry until the next day or uh, especially over his weekend. Just wasn't really interested in, in that ownership or management piece as far as I know. Yeah. And the neat thing about Tanner, which you know nobody wants to go to rural America because they say, well, there's nothing to do. But Tanner was very happily married with a baby, and when he came home at night, he didn't need bars and nightclubs and the Suns games and the Cardinals. He's totally happy in his front room with his adorable wife and two kids now, right? Is it two? Uh, 
they might have had a second one on the way. I got to ask my wife those questions. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But so, 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 why, why do you? If if you're in rural America where there's six thousand people needing a dentist, versus downtown Phoenix where there might be five hundred to one, why not just go where everybody needs you? If at night you're going to go home and play with your wife and kids, right? And and, and that's that that's the only coaching I put on a tenor is that uh, who cares if it? And, and plus, where would you rather raise a family? Small town or big city? Would you rather raise your kid in downtown LA or small town Iowa? I'd love somewhere in between, personally. Yeah. <laughs> Phoenix. I, I think you skipped over Phoenix. Where we're <laughs> um, yeah, but you brought up a, a perfect point, or he even answered it without calling it out exactly as it was. It, when I think back to dental, dental school with Tanner, uh, we're two types of students that when we had our pool of patients we're supposed to manage, recare, uh, the different competencies and things we're supposed to accomplish, these two would have a spreadsheet that would have patient name, contact information. We'd spend so much time organizational so that we really, really have beat on what was going on and we're really good at the administration side of our, of our treatment. Tanner would get lost in the mix of the administration, but was more of a clinician in dental school than we were, um, for sure. He had a passion for waxing teeth, doing some of the things that, that aren't our strengths. And so you really have to evaluate yourself. And I think he absolutely made the right decision. And where he is, he's happy. And what he's doing, he's, he's absolutely happy. I also wonder if he would have struggled in some of our, it, it's been a hard road. If I could tell you how many spreadsheets I've made in three years of being a dentist, it would blow some people's minds, but you have to be able to look at a profit and loss statement and evaluate some of those things to get to the point where you're going to own a viable practice. That's Okay. Not okay. You're, you're talking to thousands of dentists right now. And a lot of them are fourth year kids in dental school, listen to podcasts. In fact, a lot of them tell me they're listening to this during dental school, sitting in the back row. Um, describe to this individual, some red flags that lets them know if they are the entrepreneur type that would probably want to be their own boss or if they're the type like Tanner that would just rather just go in and do dentistry. What, d describe, describe some traits so this person can look in the mirror and decide which one they really are. Because what you want to believe about yourself, like I believe I look exactly like Marky Mark, but other people tell me I don't. So, so describe to this person um, I, well, I think one of the first things that came to my mind, it, it can be viewed as a, a derogatory term, but I don't view it that way, that there's an intensity. There's an intensity to um, the two of us and others that I've seen that when they graduated, they hit the ground and they said, I want practice ownership. It's in my future. If not today, at some point, I, I have an intensity about the way I want to set up my office, the instruments I want, the um, materials that I'm using. There are some DSOs out there or bigger organizations that do blend a little bit more to the dentist, but generally speaking, unless it's your baby, you don't get to call the shots on all those things. And if that matters to you a lot, you're very intense about, I need it to be this way. I want things my way or the highway. <laughs> then ownership's really the only way you get to go where you get to say, that's what I want my logo to look like. I don't like that shade of green. I want to change that just a little bit. Yeah. And I, I think you have to see some of those realities. You're about to graduate with that kind of, of debt load. So the trouble there actually becomes people lending you exorbitant amount of money to do what you want to do. Um, you need to look at look at the type of career that you want. I knew I wanted to stay here around Arizona. So some of the Heartland or some of the more corporate dental places that wanted to plug me down in Midwest uh, America wasn't going to work. And then I knew I wanted to establish early on the practice I was going to show up for 30 plus years. This is where I'm going to be. Um, so if you have a lot of those desires, the quicker you can get to it, the better. Because um, I found I couldn't do it the first year out of dental school. No one would lend me the money. I didn't have production reports, what I could produce and the kind of work I could do. Um, so it took me two or three years to walk to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, anybody and say, hey, I am the dentist I claim to be. I, I have learned some things and can do some stuff. So um, if, if you have all of that drive and those desires to, to be in control truly, to not have a boss, um, the way you have to do is right out the chute, you have to, you have to make a plan and we're a little bit different. We, we share the burden or the, the debt load that we have with the practice and we kind of split the hours. If you know a startup dental practice, and we started from scratch eight months ago, um, a startup dental practice is not profitable right away. So the two of us were kind of working for free for a while and it takes a lot of hard work. But if, if you have all those desires, you just need to plan and have the right things in place. And we can talk more about those red flags, but that's just kind of a quick answer is it's what we wanted. It's what we always wanted. The reason I went into dentistry was a sophomore year. I already had a 10 year plan. So how am I not out of dental school going to go? 
I got another 10 year plan where I'm in the driver's seat at the, at the 10 year mark. Um, so when you got out of school, you did not have access to capital to start to scratch, right? You had to work for a year or two before banks went swing you. How? Yeah. Yep. So, and, so and, what, and, what did you do out of school? Where did you work and how long did it take you before you, someone would give you a loan? So about three to three and a half years ago, I set up an interview at Today's Dental, whether you know it or not. Because <laughs> um, you were four or five miles from my house and you were open on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, so me, right out the shoot, I knew I wanted to be full-time dentistry. This is all I want to do. So I knew early on in these survival periods, I want to work six days a week because I want to get there faster to have my own thing going on. So I was all about maximizing the money that I was making to put away towards savings or to accomplish production as well so I could show the bank that, that I can do this. What they really wanted out of us when it came time, um, I believe that we just called them. If you're a dentist, they will give you $300,000 no questions asked towards starting a practice or buying a practice. The moment you want more than $300,000, they need to know either the details of the practice you are buying or they need to have a business plan from you showing that you're worthy of loaning four hundred, five hundred plus thousand dollars uh, and the, the thing that really came to us when we weren't buying a practice, we were doing a scratch start was we needed to show a history of production. So I, I joked about interviewing at, at Today's Dental, but I kind of worked around the valley. Um, I worked primarily in Maricopa. And was it for Jared Pope? No, it wasn't. He, he was actively hiring and I got a call a couple times from him as well. But this was actually for a, a fam, a distant family connection, an in-law that it's a Lyons family. I don't know if you know the Lyons in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, oral surgery and, and a couple different things. So Smile Lines was the name of the practice there. And that was wonderful. They, they paid me very well as an associate and they had Sarek in their office. So I learned a lot of really valuable things um, there. And I was only there two, three days a week, but they were long days and, and got a lot of experience. Then the other three, four days of the week, I was constantly hooking up with something for four months, then transitioning to a new thing, kind of looking. And that got to be a frustration that pushed me toward this sooner than I probably would have even planned. I got tired of looking for an associate gig, but associate ship dentistry provides an income stream that I banked a decent amount of money that I knew I could go through a drought here during a startup and my family could still survive off of some savings. And so that was really the biggest thing on, on me jumpstarting or getting primed in a position to start up. Okay. And I want to, and a lot of viewers are going to ask, cause a lot of them are single and a lot, a lot of dentists that are single um, and they're dating someone. Um, they don't realize that, you know, they, they got to keep their spouse happy. What you said you want, you knew you wanted to stay in the Valley. Was that your thoughts or was your wife or are you guys both married? Yes. Mm -hmm. Both kids. Yep. Three kids each. Three kids each. Was it, was it your wife telling you, I want to stay here by my mom and my sisters and my family or what, when you said you, that you knew you wanted to stay here, explain why. Not me. My, my wife was fine. She's very flexible and, uh, and very supportive. Mine became more, I thought that I would buy into that practice down in Maricopa or through that connection, I thought, hey, here's somebody that I've kind of known in dentistry, um, potential ownership or even starting a practice that was affiliated with it somehow. But as time went on, there just wasn't a mutually beneficial relationship there. So I kind of learned after about a year, year and a half, hey, this isn't what I thought. And I had known him during dental school for four years. I thought this is where I'm headed and where I'm going to work and do associateship to part owner to an owner. Um, but once I learned that after the first year or two, then I started setting my sights on something else. So it was actually the prospect of working in that relationship that was going to keep me here, um, but not the case. So truth be told, I could have gone somewhere else. Um, but after that year and a half of working here, this, this has become our lives where, where we've been since we were five years old. Okay. Okay. So you walk out of ATT still and uh, people not familiar with the Valley, most most of the uh, half of America lives in about 117 metros. And the other half lives in about 19,000 small towns. But um, and most of the metros, about half is the anchor city like Phoenix. And then the other half is all the surrounding areas, Glendale, Chandler, Scottsdale. How did you pick Chandler and your location versus, say, Glendale, Apache Junction, you know, Scottsdale? Did, 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 you, did you look at it demographically or did you look at it more mostly like I just want to live here? No, we actually originally were looking a little bit further up northwest uh, in Scottsdale area. We, we were considering the whole valley, but one of the primary characteristics that helped us settle or land where we ended up landing was going back to that comment made earlier about saturation, that there was at least one, if not 
one dentist on every street corner to every major intersection. And we happened to find an area here in Chandler where there were previously two dentists and both had relocated for their own personal reasons. Um, so it left a bit of a void for this community, even within the saturation of overall Phoenix. Where, so where are you guys at? Exactly. We are, we are at Cooper and Ray Road. Cooper and Ray. Yeah. So that's about yeah. what, what? What's Cooper? About uh, 10 miles due east of me. I'm on Elliott. And it's about that. About 10 miles. Cooper, I think it's Stapley as well once you hit Mesa. Yeah. So, so that was right by your dental school. Yeah. It, it's about halfway between the two of us. Yeah. Take 40 minutes to get to you, 20 minutes to get to here. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you've been open eight months? Mm -hmm. yep. And did you rent? Did you uh, rent a retail setting or a professional medical dental setting? Retail, and wouldn't look back on it. It's it's been great for our patients to just be able to pull up uh, and walk in the door. <clears throat> now we did a remodel of our office to make it very. Um, oh, so you actually got rented where the other dentists had left? Yeah. Do you remember? And I even saw. Uh, I think it was your Facebook or Google Plus. Uh, congratulations to Bob Savage once he opened his new office. Yeah, which is very pretty. He practiced here for a limited amount of time with Dr. Brown, Robert Brown. Oh wow! Um, and when we got here, it it really wasn't the layout that we liked, so we we pretty much gutted the whole thing. The only benefit was that there were there was plumbing for operatories, so we did kind of build from scratch. You, but it you is know that what's funny when you get it. older? You know what the uh, you know what the number one reason why I recommend? See, I never I never got a partner. Because, you know, I figured if half the marriages fail, and that's with a lover and children, um, why would you marry a dentist? You know, you don't have those social glues. Now, you have different social glues because your you're blood, your family, and, and dad could get involved, and mom, you know. I mean, so you have lots of glues to hold you together in the rest of us. But I would never got an associate, but I, mean, I would never got a partner. But the best thing I liked about having associates over the last 30 years, like Bob Savage, I mean, I look at all my best friends that are dentists in the Valley, and they're all people in the last 30 years that worked for me for six or seven years. I mean, you know, Sam Dominic, Tom Giacobbe, uh, Tim Taylor, Bob Savage. I mean, my best football game buddies, uh, dentists, are all people who back in the day worked six or seven years so they decided to have their own. So you took Bob Savage's old place. He, and he was, I think he was renting it for a year or so from Robert Brown. It was Robert Brown that was in this complex and he moved to i think he wanted more street traffic so he moved to gilbert downtown gilbert bought an old house and renovated it and then bob savage went next to the oregano's in that ocotillo area yeah. so both of them went three plus miles away and in general there's kind so, of a three so miles. How, so what was the total nugget to go in there and renovate that though how you wanted it how much more how much money did you guys have to put into that thing how much so, was your loan from the bank it was including the working capital. We were a total of six twenty-five. So, so then the banks gave you three three hundred thousand each. Uh, no, we borrowed together. Yeah, on, yeah. But, so uh, one project together. We had to get into details of projections of what our what our marketing plan was. Everything. And was it a national bank that gave you the money that that opens coast to coast, or was it a bank local? Bank of America is who we ended up with, and we kind of pitted Bank of America and Wells Fargo against each other. Uh, Wells had a better rate, but Bank of America's repayment was kinder to us. So we told Bank of America we like this rate, and they matched it, and we kind of ended up with the best of both worlds. Okay, explain that in a little more detail because most of these kids don't have that kind of banking history. Um, so, yeah, once we, we applied, we first met a rep from Bank of America and kind of told him the whole thing we want to do, a scratch startup, as much working capital as possible to put into marketing and really jump-starting things. Uh, and then we knew we needed to do a remodel. So in the 625, you have $75,000 of working capital. Uh, that takes you down to 550. Of the 550, uh, half of it went to kind of gutting this place and to a contractor redoing it. And, and we went through a, an architectural firm up in Colorado that does beautiful stuff, uh, Joe Architect. And so the contractor was about 250 to 300. And then the other 250 was equipment inside. We got a lot of the stuff we were familiar with coming from a newer dental school of cavo hand pieces, electrical hand pieces, pulling and crane, um, cabinetry, and I'm trying to think what else. But a lot of it was equipment in that two to three hundred thousand that was. Did, left. did you buy any big expensive toys? A hundred fifty thousand dollars Cerac machine, a hundred thousand dollars CBCT, a seventy five thousand dollars BioLace laser. Is that? Did you buy any toys with that or? Uh, not with that. We have since we we just a couple weeks ago, took out a new Patterson loan for an, an Omnicam. And so we're, we're loving the new Omnicam as well. And why are you loving the new Omnicam? 
it's changed it's changed dentistry for us i mean to jump in for a second that's uh to reiterate earlier that's where i want to um invest most of my time and energy is in in technology sector of dentistry and healthcare in general so uh, being able to get away from some of the older materials or older mindsets and into something that's much more uh, computer-aided design um, it just makes both of us more excited, more excited to present the treatment, more excited to show up to work each day. Aside, outside of that, it has a return on investment. And again, being spreadsheet people, we got down to the point, whatever crowns that we have to produce each month for it to be worthwhile and offset what a lab bill would be for us here at Brennan Dental. And, and as, as being someone who's lived half a century, the most important decision you make you know, rule number one, does it make you happy? Does it make you healthy? I mean, I, I don't even want to get into the science of amalgam versus composite or indirect versus direct. I just want the dentist not burned out and fried and drinking Listerine all day in between patients. I want them to just love what they're doing. And if you can get the dentist head on straight where they just love what they're doing, they're excited and passionate, everything else falls in line. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you keep saying that you love technology. Talk, talk about how technology because yeah, you were beaming. I mean, you're just glowing when you're talking about right. what, 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 what specifically technology are you passionate about uh, dentistry adopting and, and changing over what wasn't there 30 years ago? So I think what we've seen for growth in the last five to 10 years is what we were just talking about. CAD CAM dentistry seems to be taking, taking off that even those that are not early adopters, they kind of like to stay on the fence. We're watching as, as some of those doctors are starting to now peek their heads in and realize, um, especially with these cameras that now don't require powder, um, the, the approximation from the software that it gives you, the modeling of teeth is just so much um, more accurate anatomy to the, the patient's specific mouth. Um, all, all these features that just take away a lot of the bugs and first, first or second version things. So CAD CAM dentistry is a huge area of growth. The other that's right around the corner and, and some of the early adopters are talking a lot about is merging that with um, the cone beam kind of 3D skeletal scan technology, allowing us to venture out from just restorations, but now do a, a complete digital dentistry workflow. So when we talk about placing implants, um, we're not just sending out to a surgical guide or trying to approximate with our own eyes in the moment, but getting to plan ahead of time even mill out a custom abutment or custom healing abutment and even potentially a provisional um, that just fits like butter right when you place that implant because all of it was planned ahead of time and, and milled precisely. I've never heard the term fits like butter, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's not my, a term. My, fits smooth as butter, I think. Smooth as butter, yeah. <laughs> my, my two favorite food groups are bacon and butter, so I, uh, I like the way you think. So did you do a CBCT too, a, a 3D? We haven't yet, and, and mostly because of limitation of resources, we're, we're not. Um, if you were going to do a 3D x-ray machine, since you have um, Cirac, Serona's uh, CAD CAM, would you buy the Galileos, or would you go to open format and get something else? No, we would get the Galileos. And, and um, Dent Supply just merged with Serona. And the million-dollar question is, uh, right now, are you using the uh, Ivoclare Emacs blocks for your CAD CAM? Yep. What percent of the time do you mill a restoration or use an Emacs? 94%, 96%. <laughs> do you think it'll be different when uh, now that they're married to Densefly? Because Densefly's got a block. Uh -huh. what, what's the Densefly block? You know off the top of your head? Um, um, even Serona has its own blocks, though. It, for the longest time, Emacs has just made a surge to be the block to use. But... It, but I think we're going to see a whole flock of people that come to the table with a lot, a lot new. The, the lithium disilicate, I've heard of a lot of kind of modifications to that and a lot of new blocks that are going to flood the market. But Emacs is still the number one block, even though Serona has a lot of their own blocks. They have Seric blocks and, and Serona brand blocks. Um, but for, for right now, Emacs is that number one that they're kind of using as a... a I don't know, racehorse for... I want to, I want to, ask, I want to ask you guys, because uh, you're basically both old enough to be my children. Um, what do you say, um, and, and I, I mean that in a way that your generation grew up on technology. I mean, I, I still think uh, my boy's grandfather, he, the, one of the worst decisions he ever made is when they came out with the computer, he always said, well, gr grandma uh, does all the typing. And we're just like, well, 
I, I know you type on a computer, but there's, there's slightly differences between a typewriter and the internet. And he never made the connection to the internet. I just think of all the things he missed out on because he viewed that damn PC as a typewriter and grandma does all the typing. <laughs> and uh, But a lot of people are saying that, um, um, why would you buy a $100,000 uh, 3D x-ray machine, like a Galileos or whatever, when your iPhone, uh, you know, no, nobody, the average person's keeping a smartphone three years and they're upgrading it to later and greater. And we've seen so many big changes in the 3D x-ray machines just in the last five years. So some people are saying that you just want access to a 3D x-ray machine, that you certainly don't want to own one because you don't want to be, just like you wouldn't want to be on your Motorola flip loan right now. What, what, what would you say to that? You know, it's, I, I would draw an analogy and it's not a perfect one, but, but right off the bat, it reminds me a little bit of some of some of the reason why I send certain things to specialists and other things that I would prefer to do in-house as a general dentist. Um, and one of the primary reasons is my patients don't want to go elsewhere. They've, they've gotten to know me, my office, they're comfortable here. So one of the primary reasons it, that I would do that is so that I don't have to send them somewhere else to get that scan, that they're comfortable in our office and get this sense that we're able to accomplish everything across the board for that patient. Now it requires additional training, it requires additional investment. I really need to be able to see this, this buzzword in the industry, the return on investment, that I'm not going into the ground just so I can claim to have a CBCT. But if, if it does um, at least pay for itself, if not uh, turn a profit for me, then I, I, why wouldn't I consider having my own as long as I'm capable of reading the scans and, and using it? So what it, so, so holding on to your thought of one-stop shopping, you know, you go into a Walmart, you know, my four boys <laughs> used to always get mad because whenever they wanted something, I just sort of take them to Walmart and, and they'd say, well, Walmart doesn't have it. And I say, well, if you needed it, it'd be in here. They've got everything. So if you need something that ain't in Walmart, you don't need it. End of story. And they, uh, it was so funny. They were little, I'd say, well, you want to go to Walmart? They'd already roll their eyes. Uh, they don't have, they don't carry it. But, um, oh, it was a, so of the nine specialties, what are you keeping in house? I mean, um, what are you, are you guys learning any ortho, endo, perio, pedo, prost? What? Yeah, so we don't keep a hundred percent of any specialty in house. We still use every, pretty much every specialty across the board for some percentage of cases. Um, some of our uh, background is based on the school we went to and where there are strengths. So, for example, we feel extremely comfortable with oral surgery. Uh, I, it, we, so AT still's big in oral surgery, huh? Yeah, especially exodontia and even implant training. And those are kind of the primary oral surgery pathways that, that we have. But if I get something, um, some pathology or a really difficult implant case, that I'm still partnering up with an oral surgeon to, to do that case. Um, endodontics, we keep probably... Yeah. What percent would you say? Yeah, like 75%. We send some upper second molars, and if I don't see a canal, then it's going. Um, but no, it, and I, I credit the university we came from with a lot of that. I don't know if all dental schools are created equal. I haven't had that experience elsewhere, but our externships and the way we were kind of thrown into the community, that, that is the biggest thing at AT still is community dentistry. Um, we spent together six weeks up in North Dakota at an Indian health services hospital, and it was unbelievable the experiences we got to have people coming with teeth broken off and we're the dentist for them. There's somebody supervising us, but left and right, we got those experiences in dental school. So extremely comfortable seeing all specialties. We, we do a lot of pedo as well, but, but it's nice as a general dentist, one of the biggest perks to me has always been, but I always have that backdrop of I'm getting a little uncomfortable or I may not be able to tackle this, that I always have that end of the road specialist to refer to. So I, uh, I have to tell you, um, I, I've met a lot of dental school deans, and I, I, I'm not saying this because your dental school is in my backyard, but I, I think Jack Dillenberg is the nicest, sweetest. Dean. I mean, most of the deans, then they, they come from a world where I'm sure they thought it was the best way, but it was, it was a, like a, uh, um, a boot camp, you know, Marine, Marine guy. Mm -hmm. And they just, I just think they really believe that the harder, meaner, and more asinine their decisions, they, they'd make you more a man. I'm sure they had the best intentions. But, I mean, there was a lot of kids in my dental school that, and I've heard it from other dental schools, where if they could have killed their dean and not got caught, you know, it wouldn't even be a question. You know, they just would have been, you know, if I could do this without getting caught. And Jack 
flip the model and said, no, it's not about being a, a Marine Corps boot camp guy. He wanted to intimately know you guys. He loves his students. And, by, and, and that community outreach is where I love Jack the most is, man, I've done missionary dental trips in Chiapas, in Adiak, in Tanzania, where that school was paying money to send their students to the third world because Jack thinks that if you're in dentistry and it's all about the money, you, you missed the whole boat. I mean, he, he taught you guys how to want to help people, whether it be on an Indian public health service, at a mission in a foreign country. I mean, he's really big. And every time I go to these, um, these um, volunteer clinics and everything, it's all filled with AT still kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, just to piggyback on that, when, uh, and to give a little bit more background, you know, we focused on the private practice discussion throughout. Um, but Elliot's really here at, at our private practice uh, quite a, a bit more than me. He's doing that full time. Um, when I'm not here, I'm an associate dean up at the uh, Arizona School of Dentistry with Dr. Dillenberg. Um, for I, I do informatics, innovation, community partnerships with that um, position there. So I can speak both. You do what there? I, I'm the, dean, the associate dean of innovation, informatics, and community partnerships. Wow. So it's kind of a, yeah. It's, it's a, say, say it again, innovation. Innovation, informatics, and community partnerships. Explain that. So, yeah, that, how much time do we have? <laughs> All the time you want. You're the last podcast today. The only thing I have for you is lunch. And since I'm 30 pounds overweight, I don't even need that. So, so I'll break down the three areas. And, and they really, again, deal with that passion. Um, the innovation portion is to take a look at, at ASDO across the curriculum. So our didactic years, that first and second year, into the sim clinic and even into the clinic and find ways that we can improve our, our systems, especially as they relate to technology. So um, we talked about CAD CAM, CBCTs, that, that's been a focus for a, a couple years here. Um, the, bleeding into informatics a little bit, talking through how we use data in our school, how we grade and evaluate our students and what system we, we use to do that. Um, and just even setting up and, and maintaining our practice management software for our patient records. Uh, and then finally, the community partnerships component. So I have a master's in public health as well, and that, that helps drive my, um, my desire or passion to be involved with that public health. You know, it's contagious. What, what Jack has us as students doing, we still want to keep some component of that, if not dedicate our lives to it. And so the community partnerships has to do with all these sites that we set up. Um, I work with Dr. Cottom, who's our vice dean now, uh, used to be in that position. How, how do you say his name? Cottom? Cottom. Yep. Wayne Cottom. How do you spell Cottom? Uh, C-O-T-T-A-M. Oh, okay. And that's really been his baby to his Is credit. he the number two dean if Jack retires? Is that the, would that he's be the, the... He's the vice dean. Yep. He's the vice dean. Is there, is there a... Uh... Is there already a scheduled transition? I mean, Jack's got to be 70, isn't he? How old do you think uh, Jack is? He celebrates, if I'm not betraying his trust, he celebrates his 70th this month. This month? Did you know the date? Uh, we are having a celebration on the 18th. I don't know if that's his actual birthday, but I believe it's the 18th. Will, will you email me that? Sure. Oh, my God. I love Jack. Yeah. Yeah. It's. it's I, I got to tell you my, my Jack. Oh, anyway, but go, go on. Go on. No, so anyway, we, we just um, team up to, to make sure that our sites are all set up correctly, that the, the, they're really adjunct faculty out at those sites, that they're calibrated to be able to give our students appropriate feedback um, and have a ton of great support staff to do that. And then we have a mobile dentistry unit, and I know you know um, uh, Eric Harris really well. He runs that, uh, but that's part of our community dentistry initiative as well. <clears throat> I climb Mount Kilimanjaro with Eric Harris. Yeah, yeah. He is, he is so damn cool. God, yep. I love that guy. Um, actually, uh, actually met his dad first. I met his dad 30 years ago. And, yep. uh, and I, I actually uh, was honest with his dad. I told him I was going to use him. And I said, can I, can I just be up front and just tell you I'm going to use you? And he says, sure. And he says, well, how are you going to use me? And I said, well, I have four baby boys. Like, and they were like one, two, three, and four. And you have four sons. And they're all, you know, 20, 22, 24, 26. And I just want to be your friend to get all the advice you can on how to raise four baby boys. And he said, cool. So we went up to, uh, you know, we would go to continuing education places like LVI and we'd share a hotel room. So we'd learn dentistry in the day. Then at night, we just lay there in our, you know, our beds and he'd 
give me all everything he knew about raising boys. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, Joe Harris. What what a man. Um, yeah. So back to that sim clinic. You know what would be the most innovative thing you could do with your sim clinic? What's that? Go find the biggest four thousand pound gorilla law firm in Phoenix, Arizona, and sue a state board because it's not a standardized test. These kids come out of the, uh, dental school with three to four hundred thousand dollars student loans. They're jerking their chain, telling them they got to go take some state board when the school was already certified. And you should have found out in four years of dental school whether or not the kid's a dentist or not, not on a one-day exam. And if Elliot goes in there and he's got a cooperative patient that shows up on time and doesn't move in the chair, and yours doesn't even show or shows 30 minutes late or can't get numb because the nerve, it's not a standardized test. Mm-hmm. And with, with a sim lab, those, those, those board tests should be in dental schools with sim labs. And you should all have the exact same damn plastic tooth. And if it's not standardized, it's not legal. Yep. There's a lot of movement in that direction, especially with the portfolio movement out in California. And now that they're for the first time certifying and, and counting that as they're essentially like a board exam. Well, uh, tell, tell me about that. I'm not aware of that. Explain. I, out in California, their portfolio is a little different than what we do at, at ASDO or AT Still um, or other places potentially. But they, they can use their portfolio for certification and get their license via portfolio rather than an, a board exam like you're describing where you have a, a real live patient. So it's one of the first very progressive thinking, but yeah, you're not alone thinking that. Well, tell, tell, tell Jack this. Um, if AT, AT still has got a sim lab, so he's got skin in the game. He could have the board in his own dental school. I'm sure he can make money off that. And I've got an attorney who's the best. If Jack, if AT Still and Dentaltown want to go 50-50 on an attorney and sue the next board, I, I'm totally game. Because, because I think these kids are they're just being harassed. I mean, they don't have the time and the money and the stress. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times you go to a graduation class and – Nobody no ever says it was a good experience taking my boards at the end of dental school. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's just absolutely stupid. It's, it's stupid on so many levels. The only thing that will that'll shake it up is the damn lawyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, okay, I want to go back to informatics. Um, so you're in informatics. You love technology, management information software. What practice management software did you pick to run your private dental office? I mean, so Patterson owns EagleSoft. Henry Schein owns uh, Dentrix. Uh, there's uh, PracticeWorks, SoftDent. There's Open Dental. What, what did you pick and why? Well, realize for a moment that, that we probably are a little bit more on the bell curve in the early adopter phase, uh, just both of us even. I'm, I'm not alone in that. Elliot also has, has um, quite a bit of uh, skill in, in manipulating new technology. Um, but ultimately, we, we wanted to do something that was cloud-based if it could be viable. And we've experienced a lot of cloud-based products um, and decided to go with Dentrix Ascend. That's Dentrix's kind of next generation product that they've been building for about three and a half years. And I have absolutely no regret with doing that for our new startup and all of the, um, the use that we get out of our uh, practice management software. It's, it's been wonderful. Okay, so since it's on the cloud, you don't have to have all your servers. You just have internet connection with PCs or are they dummy terminals or explain yep. explain what that means. So for practice management purposes, that's all correct. But you do still have to solve the question of imaging because imaging isn't traditionally not part of your practice management solution. So we do still have a traditional server that hosts our imaging, um, and even that's right on the cusp of of providing a cloud based product um, that we're actually beta. So you don't have to do. Um, so, so your software is like when I use Google, it's, it's, it's all in the cloud. So, yes. so, so explain to the viewer who really doesn't know what the cloud means and what, what is the advantage of having this stuff on the cloud versus in a box underneath your desk? Yeah, so the benefit really is you get to call it home um, or you're wondering if, if your morning tomorrow morning fell through at home, I can log into my software Uh, I can finish notes that evening. I can check my schedule tomorrow. I can look up a patient's chart if I'm getting an emergency call. Um, There's really a lot of benefit there. Traditionally, you would have had to had to portal in somehow to your backed up server in your office and there's securities questions there and HIPAA questions. But um, no, it's just a basic login and and you're right there. The other huge benefit is it doesn't get bogged down. It doesn't get old. It doesn't get outdated. They update continuously. So 
if they add some feature where now I can email my patients a new cover letter or something like that. So what was the, was the cloud the top priority feature you were looking for then you worked down from there? Yes, yes. Then, and then say, well, so what were your choices on the cloud? Isn't, um, what's the place in Utah? There's one in Utah Curve. on the cloud. Curve. Curve. Then, is, is Open I Dental? three years down in Maricopa. So you use Curve for three years? <clears throat> so why did you use Curve for three years but then go with Dentrix to Sun? Um, the, the way I've described it is I felt like Dentrix and Henry Schein saw this cloud movement coming. So they started planning and they started designing Dentrix Ascend and they were testing it and getting very stable with the core elements to it. Curve was first one to market. They were blasting it wide open of jump on, check this out. And as a result, I watched in that three years, I, I watched us build Curve with them. They were missing things, things were glitchy. It was really a tough build. So at the end of the three years, yes, we had a good product there, but then I wanted to look at others because I was getting tired of it. it. It really comes down to how my office staff does with it. Isn't, and, isn't and Curve and Dentrix both in Provo, Utah? They're down the street from each other at this point, yep. In Provo? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so was Curve like ex-Dentrix people? Did, did someone at Dentrix so. they're, leave they're, and, because they didn't start the cloud fast enough and Ascend was after the Curve people left? I mean, I'm just... Just wondering. Several, several. Um, at, at one point, their CEO had been a, a Dentrix lifer for a long time, and then several employees as well. Um, but the the president or the founder of Curve was actually a kid out of Canada, grew up servicing dental offices, doing that build out of servers, clients, and kind of came up with this concept of it, it shouldn't have to be this hard for all these offices. Yeah, so, and, and what I don't understand is franchises. Like, if, you, if you're a McDonald's with 40,000 locations, why is each store manager trying to do backups? And yeah. why, why, why aren't all franchises on the cloud? Uh, I think mostly because it's just now hitting its stride. It's, it's just it, now, <laughs> it's, it's, would you say the cloud has just gone from bleeding edge to leading edge? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, 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 and were there any? In those three years, we were working out a lot of bugs, billing issues, ledger issues, charting issues. A lot of that was getting worked out in those three years. But since we started with Dentrix Ascent, it's all been very stable. And I think Curve is stable as well. We just wanted to start with something yeah. new. And Henry Schein's kind of a bigger bear in the game than, than Curve was. Curve was a, a garage project. And yeah. Were well, there any other clouds? Is, is Open Dental, was that a cloud-based system? No, they, they do have a portal that allows you to see some limited information. So it's kind of that section is a little hybrid-esque, but no, it's not. Um, another one would be Planet DDS. Um, Lime, Denticon is what they call it. Denticon? Uh, yeah. Um, Dovetail is another one. That that one wasn't very advanced. It was missing some real core features for us. Since you're the uh, dean of uh, innovation informatics, do you have a uh, do you know the top dog at the Dentrix Ascend problem? I mean, Dentrix Ascend cloud. I, I do, I do, and and um, we've met with them a few times to look at um, how to as far as academia goes. It, what opportunities exist? Tell tell him I'd like to podcast him on Dentrix on the cloud. Yeah, I, I'm sure he'd be – he's a great guy. He's out there in, in Salt Lake as well. Yeah, they, they don't like the fact that no, – no one likes criticism. Uh -huh. and I've been uh, – I've told them my criticism of all the software systems since the beginning, and I've told them ever since I got my, my MBA from ASU, the fact that it doesn't merge with an accounting platform. Like, yeah. like yeah. and we like, have that complaint as well. We, we've yeah, got I mean, that, that, that's just – I mean, I, they, they, they flew me down to a Dentrix conference or whatever, and I'm just like – I mean, I, I don't want to get off on the rant because it'll raise my blood pressure 50 points, but every time they come out with these big updates, it's like, God dang, this, guy, this dentist is doing seven different PPOs, and he doesn't know if he's making money or losing money on each fee schedule, and, and nobody runs a business where you don't take all that customer information and billing while it's overlaid on, Dent, on uh, Quicken or Peachtree or Microsoft's Great White Plan, something, I mean... I just wanted I just wanted dentists to know at the end of the day you did three thousand dollars your overhead was twenty two dollars and fifteen cents and this is what you netted and then when they they fill out a, a fee schedule they're signing up for a PPO well the schedule knows you took an hour to do a crown so if you do it for eight hundred dollars it knows if you're making money and how much or if you're losing money because I know I know that what happens in dental offices they make so much money so much net on crowns root canals dentures and endo. I mean, extractions.
that they're blanketing over what they're doing for a loss, which is cleanings, exams, x-rays, and fillings. And when a dentist sits in that operatory for an hour and does an MOD composite for 250 on a PPO, and then the next hour he's doing their a crown for an hour for a thousand, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, do you have a 75% profit margin? I don't think you do. Mm-hmm. So you'd spend an hour doing a filling and lost 200 bucks. And then you went in the next room and you made 600 bucks for that 600 bucks. You had to take 200 of it and cover the other guy that you did for loss. And if everybody knew where they were making or losing money, you'd start seeing a lot more amalgams. You'd start seeing a lot of dentists working faster and spending less time on Facebook. I mean, how many dentists, you know, they go numb up and then they go in their room and let it soak in for 10 minutes while they're on the internet or Facebook or calling their wife but if they knew, man, I'm not going to make money on this procedure unless I do it in 30 minutes, hell, they'd be numbing up with septicane and then set a timer for four minutes and then be sit, putting their burr on and not changing gloves. And if, if they knew, it's just like in football. You notice how excited they get when they get inside the red zone? Mm-hmm. You know, they're playing very differently when they're on the one-yard line than when they're back on the 50-yard line. Yeah. And, and sure. the, the, Football's a great example because I, I heard a stat this last week and it was just ridiculous that John Gruden was giving a stat about the, the number of yards that one running back was making compared to another running back from where they start with the ball. And it wasn't that somebody sitting there and looking at only of that of every game and everything. It's that computers have come so far that all the information was there, but the computing of it is different. And dentistry is no different. Why, why do all these softwares not have my employees clocking in through the software? I know. So and that's your number one, co- that's your number one cost. The hours I'm open and doing some averages, the days I'm open and giving me what's my on pace for the month. If I at the close of business today, it should automatically calculate and tell me, hey, you're on pace for production of this per month and show me it against last year. It's just, you're absolutely right. And, so and let's that's, get what, the- that's, that's what we talk about when we're spreadsheet people are outside the box. Software's not doing it for you. So you have to be an individual that either has a bookkeeper, an accountant, somebody, or yourself, that you outside have the business management to go calculate some of those things. What am I on pace for? What are our goals? What did we do last year? What are we doing today? And so do you think that poor bastard from uh, uh, Dentrix would be brave enough to sit here for an hour? And in fact, in fact, you guys should come over to my house and we all, we all go to your place. <laughs> Beat them up together? Is that? <laughs> well, well it, 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 I, I mean, I've tried beating up for 20 years. I, I've tried love. I, I've flown down to Maryville, New York, and asked Stan Bergman in his office in the flesh on my own dime. And, yeah. and, and, and I mean, I mean I, I've been on this mission for 28 years. Well, let me at least, not to come to their defense at all, but let me at least say what I've heard from them when they set out to design Dentrix Ascend. They spent the first year and a half just interviewing people going to dental offices throughout the country and interviewing and not dentists, front office, back office, the people that use the software the most. But they they did interview some dentists, not just dentists. And then they put together the software and they really found that they had two huge projects that they needed to prioritize one or the other somewhat. One was setting up a, a core set of features that every practice management software seems to have and do it in the most efficient way possible. And the other was set it up for applications and to be able to get to that data. In the tech world, they refer to that as an API or an application programming interface. That's what all of these things have that allow it to talk to other software like accounting software. So they really uh, rolled the dice, but they said, well, even if we designed the most beautiful application interface software, if we don't have the core product, we've got next to nothing. Um, so we're, we're going to prioritize that core set of features first for Dentrix Ascend, but not lose sight of that. That's what I've been told throughout, that now that they're getting to the core, that at some point they're supposed to become uh, or, or launch some sort of application interface for, for that software. Well, I'd like to get involved quick because I'm, I finally have given up on SoftEnd after 28 years. Mm-hmm. And I don't know whether to go to Ascend, Curve, or Open Dental. Mm-hmm. And my office in Ahwatukee, me and my office manager, Robert, are dealing. We, we need to make a decision like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I would like to talk to him. Just for that, S- send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com and CC him and, okay. and, uh, and we'll get a dialogue going. Okay. But I, I really think the single greatest legacy I could ever leave dentistry is just to get them to know their cost at the end of the day on their gosh darn practice management software. I mean, I mean, I have, 
And when I first set out with that in MBA school and realized how just how bloody important that was, I thought once I explained it to him, because remember, you can't do customer research. I mean, if Henry Ford went and asked all the Americans, hey, would you like to shoot your horse and have a horseless carriage? Mm-hmm. Everyone has said, I, I love my horse. I pet him every day. I feed him. I wa- my horse is my best friend. And, he, and when other car companies were saying horseless carriage, he's like, are you crazy? They love their horse. Mm-hmm. So we're going to build a car, and we're not competing with your best friend. And, and, and it was very subtle that your horse can only go 20 miles a day, but your car can go 20 miles an hour. Yeah. And, uh, and, they, and Henry Ford did no custom research, and, and Steve Jobs is the same way. He said, I, I can't, I'm not going to ask these people what the future is. I have to go find the future and show it to them. And that's what I keep telling the design people because they keep coming back with their research, and then it says, well, they want to be able to change the font of the patient notes and change it from black to purple. And it's like... Well, don't, you know, you got to be bigger than that. You got to be bigger than that. Okay, you know, okay, you want to change your font. Um, you want voice activated pair. Okay, that's what they want. They don't know what they need because they're dentists. They're not MBAs. You know, they're not millionaire businessmen. I said, you know, why don't you, why don't you give them what Stan Bergman needs when he does a press conference on his publicly traded stock? They're not asking him what color his font is or if he has voice activated notes. They want to know earnings and yeah. price per share. They, they want to know financial data. And if you just deliver that to the dentist, they'd all look at it and go, oh, I had no idea that every time I do a PPO, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, MOD composite for $174, that I open up my wallet and shred three $20 bills. Yeah, and that's, that's why dentists will pay $20,000 for a consultant to come in for a weekend and just do spreadsheets and calculate those stats and show them that paper. And they go, oh, my goodness. And then they make one change and they go, Totally worth it. I made forty thousand dollars more last year because I had this consultant cut. It's ridiculous. The the consultant fees and and business is so good because we're so limited there. So and there's no reason. Computers and, and data has come so far. It should be so easy. But yeah. And you know when I got out of school, none of this even existed. Mm-hmm. So I, I just I just want to live longer just to see if my boys are going to go through the same experience. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine what's going to be existing twenty years from now. Uh, um, but, um, so the, the, the million dollar question we didn't get to, and I only got you for three minutes left is, uh, how did you get new patients? How, how did you get patient flow? Yeah. Um, was it, was it old tradition? Oh, well, you got a retail location and that counts as marketing. Yep. And we get, we get walk-ins here or there, but that's certainly not our primary method. Uh, we do direct mail marketing through Chris ad. Have you heard of Chris ad as well? Sure. And is that uh, working? Yeah, it works very well. We've, we've averaged 65 to 70 new patients since we opened. We had one month at 95, one month at 60. And explain to what Chris Ad means. It, it's, a, it's a coupon package. Uh, it, well, no, they're, they're one, one mailer. I'm, I wish we... But, it, but it's a package of a lot of little coupons? Nope. You're, you're it. So you go directly to their home as your individual piece of mail, and it's, it's got your message on it there. And, and the big things are that you put up no red lights to your patients. We accept all insurances. We work with all insurances, and we do. Um, if an insurance company will talk and pay for us, if an HMO won't work with us, we would have, you know, we would have worked with them and gone there. But, but again, it's a direct mail marketing. They they get that flyer at home. They call in about it, and we we start the process there. So uh, his name's John Christensen. They're out of California. They have a lot of dental clients throughout the United States. And can you email me his name and uh, and link, and so I can put that in the show's notes? Yeah, definitely. What- what, what's his name? John Christensen. Is the Do guy you have his started. email address? Yeah. Yeah, it's email, a, email uh, me, Howard at Dentaltown, and email him, and then I'll put that in the show's notes, and he'll get some new biz. Yeah, no, it, it, it's phenomenal. And, and that because was, most, people, we, most people would think that your marketing would have been all digital, all Facebook, all Twitter, but you're, you're old-fashioned paper yeah. through the United the States patient, Post Office. The patient you want is, yeah, we, we'd love – patients to come from every stream out there. Um, but they, they research marketing. And so they're looking, they look for, it, it honestly is moms. Moms are scheduling the doctor's appointment for kids and husband. And so those moms get in the mail, being at home, it, it targets moms specifically to be family friendly and, and get them in the door. Um, we're gonna move that over. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, he'll pull one over. This is us taking notes on one of our mailers and that's probably too hard to see from there, but. No, we can see um, it perfectly. Yeah, it's it's very. Who's nice. the girl? Is that one? What's that? I say, who's your model there? Are they they design that for you? That, that's all theirs. Yep. And okay, and then what what about hours? Since there's two of you, do you cover more hours? Do you think that's a big form of marketing? Yeah. So let me tell you that too. I 
I told you I, I came in just to kind of walk around when I was looking for a day or two with you guys. The only other thing I've ever rubbed shoulders with you on or heard from, and I wish I could remember who told me, but he said, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, Howard Ferran told me a story and said in the year he opened his practice, he told his wife, I'll see you in two or three years <laughs> because I'm going to have to be at that practice around the clock building it. And that's one thing I'd say in the theme of new dentists, if you're going to start your own thing and get after it, um, the availability for patients. We're here Monday to Saturday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. 7 a.m. to 7 There's nothing around us that gives hours like that. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday? And yeah. you would say, what oh, a my. night on overhead. But that's, that's been our, our saving grace. We had an endodontist refer us an implant in our first month. We had patients repeatedly coming saying, I'm so glad you're open on Saturday. Um, we, we beat local dental urgent care or, or urgent cares. We beat them on hours. And and once that gets out and somebody came after work, they go back to work and they say, I didn't take off work to get a cleaning. A cleaning is like a haircut. Why would I take a day off work to go get my teeth cleaned? And so that, that I account for a lot of our new patient numbers being really good as well as the hours we offer. And, and what is a haircut? Can you explain it to me? I, I no. I, <laughs> <laughs> is this something you saw your brother, your brother right. get once? I, I don't know if that's the dementia kicking in or if it's just been 20, 20 to 30 years. <laughs> but Johnny, I actually feel sorry for you because being in LA has spent no time Combing, brushing, oh, I'm headed that way. Don't know if we, you we, tell. It's around the corner. You're, you're my future. When, when people tell me, they say, what, what, you know, what do you think? You're losing your hair. I said, no, I lost my brush, my comb, my shampoo, my conditioner. I, li I lost uh, five minutes of bologna every morning. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? You know what? I, if you guys ever get the time, um, I called you guys because, you know, I get so many requests for, they want to hear from a new guy, you know, the new one starting up. Um, we have 350 courses on Dentaltown. And they've been viewed over half a million times because guys like you don't want to close down their office and fly to another city to go hear a convention on a root canal when you can just sit in your chair at home on your iPad and watch it online. You should do a, you should do a continuing education with a class on the, the, the startup. I bet if you just named it right, like the, you know, the, the, new, the new office startup, you know, two, two young dental school graduates started their own practice. They're just going to tell you their story. Mm -hmm. My God, I bet that would get so many views. That'd probably get more views than root canals, fillings, and crowns because mm -hmm. they're, they're hungry for it because, yeah. you know. And we're good for it. And I, I don't think we had planned. This was very kind of casual, um, but, but I think with a little bit of thought and organization, we do have some really good points of there were a lot of, there was a lot to the process. Um, we haven't even touched on it today, but we assessed a lot of things. That, that marketing, we had a lot coming into it with marketing, um, location, the hours were going to be open. We had side jobs and side income to alleviate some of the burden. And then you do, we didn't even talk about student loans. You're right. A divorce or other things could be the same lump sum that you have on your shoulders there, but you have to understand your student loans and it doesn't take much, but people sit there and they fear them. And, and what, what do they need to know about their student loans? Payment options. Yeah. That, that you're not bound to pay all of your students, student loans off in 10 years or else you're, you're hosed that there's a lot of opportunity for new programs that have come out with income-based repayment, especially early in your career when your income's not very high, that they take a percent of your, your adjusted gross income and they divide it over 12 months and that's, that's what you're paying per month. So you're naturally accruing more interest over time, but it's, it's offsetting it so that you're not so strapped with that huge, huge student loan number coming out of school that how am I supposed to pay thousands and thousands a month my first month out into practice? Yeah. The, other, the other thing is it's back there on your credit report. So I can't tell you how many underwriters I've talked to in the last three years. I guarantee that's, that's a new thing for people. You apply for a car loan and they say, no way. Your student loans are way too heavy. Underwriters and anybody you're going to for money on your house, mortgage, your, your practice loan, anything, they don't understand student loans because it's all so new that these lump sums are there in the repayment schedule. So there is a little bit more information that people need to explore, but it's not as scary or, or confusing as it might seem. I mean, you should write an article on that for Dentaltown yeah. magazine. Sure. <laughs> because every year we have the, the new grad issue. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you ever want to do that or do a course on it, I, 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 I know there's demand. That, that's why I called you guys. I was asking around all my friends, you know, who should I talk to? And they all were pointing to you guys. Great. Yeah, we'd love to. And, uh, well, hey, uh, man, thank you guys so much. And you know what I was also thinking is uh, I've, I've done – how many podcasts have we just done, Ryan? What is this? Yeah, we released number 225 today, and I've never done a dental school dean. And the only two deans I'd ever want to do 
would have been Art Dugoni of UAP, mm-hmm. and he's retired now, so I missed that opportunity. And so it'd be Jack. They're yeah. the only they're the only two dental schools where people say nice, fun, loving things of their dean, despite that uh, Jack might be wild and crazy in, in areas where I mean we're all we're all uh, we're all wild and crazy, but. People love and respect Jack Dillenberg, and uh-huh. you go to other dental schools. And I mean, you look on Dental Town. I mean, some of these people are post that. My dental school sent me an envelope wanting a donation for their deal and what they wanted to write. And some yeah. of them actually posted letters that they stuck back into the envelope and mailed back to him. So tell Jack I want to podcast him. Okay. And I can either drive down there and uh, film it live, or he can come to my house, or we can Skype like this. Uh, I don't know if Jack knows what Skype is. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah or, or yeah or you could set up with them but uh hey guys thanks for all you do thanks Thank for you. I, I think what you've done today is you've given a uh a pep talk to a bunch of kids who are sitting there on the sidelines scared and nervous i think you just gave a bunch of people a lot of uh self-esteem and love and good advice good right. thanks for having us yeah all right buddy it's worth it and we appreciate it yeah all right have a great day okay you all too. right you too